Is Israel preparing to target Iran's nuclear facilities? I asked that question because the Israel-Iran shadow war is taking a dangerous turn with each passing day. After allegedly bombing Iran's diplomatic mission in Syria, Israel, it seems, is planning something bigger. According to a report cited by the Times of Israel, the country has been conducting air force drills recently. And what are they in preparation of exactly? Well, the report says Israel is preparing to target Iran's nuclear facilities and other key infrastructure. You see, regional tensions escalated when suspected Israeli warplanes bombed Iran's consulate in Damascus last week, killing seven people, including Iran's top commander. Though Israel neither confirmed nor denied involvement, both Tehran and Damascus blamed Israel. In fact, Iran also swore revenge for the killing of its military generals. Since then, Israel has been in a state of high alert, bracing itself for any retaliatory strike from its arch nemesis. They say that if Iran attacks Israel directly, Israel will retaliate by striking targets. But by the looks of it, Israel is not taking any chances. Over the weekend, Israel relocated troops from Gaza's Khan units, in fact, cancelled leaves for its combat units, and mobilized more troops for air defense units. And if the latest report about Israel preparing to attack Iranian nuclear plants is accurate, then the world may be staring at a big escalation in West Asia, bigger than the ones previously imagined. It raises the specter of a wider war. Could Israel attack Iran's nuclear facilities? Experts say Israel could. In fact, let me tell you about what happened in the year 1981. In June of that year, the Israeli Air Force bombed an unfinished nuclear reactor in Iraq. It was Israel's most daring airstrike. In the 1970s, Iraq's dictator Saddam Hussein had started work on building a nuclear reactor. Israel, considering it as a big threat, bombed the under construction nuclear reactor. It was the longest range airstrike by Israel in a single day. But realistically speaking, what happens when you attack a nuclear facility? Radioactive leak that would result in death and destruction. Simply put, it would be catastrophic. The question is, will Israel go that far? Will the tensions between Israel and Iran take a nuclear turn? Also, what do the numbers look like? Although there is no official data on this, multiple reports suggest that Israel's nuclear stockpile ranges between 80 to 400 nuclear warheads. These warheads reportedly can be delivered in multiple ways by aircraft, submarines, missiles, you name it. We are not saying Israel will use them, but in times of rising tensions, of course, it's worth factoring in the capabilities of the countries. And remember, since the Gaza war erupted, a number of Israeli officials have not only publicly talked about Israel's possession of nuclear weapons, but have suggested how such weapons of mass destruction could be used to target Gaza. So then in case there is a full scale regional war with Iran, could things take a nuclear turn is the question. There's, of course, no way of knowing. Let's talk about Iran for now. Until now, Tehran has avoided directly entering the conflict in West Asia, but it has supported its heavily armed proxies in the region. It has also ramped up its uranium enrichment program. According to the United Nations nuclear watchdog, IAEA, Iran has sped up production of 60% enriched uranium. This is very close to the 90% needed for a nuclear bomb. But the IAEA also states that Iran does not seem to have made the political decision to translate, translate its growing nuclear capability into a weaponization program. And more recently, Iran also attacked an Israeli manned intelligence outpost in Iraq. According to Western media reports, the Islamic Republic has also made its military more immune to first strikes against its key missile and nuclear facilities. Iran and its proxies are believed to be in possession of long-range, high-precision missiles that could easily reach Israeli targets. All this worries the U.S. and its allies. 
Already, they worry about Tehran's potential to make a nuclear bomb, which the West has long sought to curb. But having the technical ability does not mean that Iran is interested in building a nuclear bomb. Experts also say that even though Iran occasionally issues threats, it's not interested in courting a wider war. Since the war started, experts have been warning that should Israel's moves against Hamas bring it into direct conflict with Iran, the result would be immediate escalation. Six months later, the possibility of a direct Israel-Iran conflict is looking more and more plausible. Will the shadow war take a nuclear turn? That remains to be seen. Now, Pakistan's all-weather friend, China, has become a nuisance for most of its neighbors. Take Japan, for example. Today, 92% of the Japanese consider China a security threat, so much so that a majority of the population supports an increased expenditure on security. Our next report telling you more. A recent survey found that 92% of Japanese consider China a security threat. But are you really surprised? It's China we are talking about, an aggressor in chief. The annual survey was carried out by a newspaper. A year ago, 86% respondents said China was a security threat to Japan. It was 81% in the previous year. The graph is steadily rising, as is Chinese aggression. To top that, Russia's invasion of Ukraine changed a lot in Asia. It made it sit up and take notice. It also made people realize that China could be walking down the same road. It could be taking a cue from Russia and invading Taiwan. What happens then? It is the start of another war. One that is almost certain to draw in the United States. Japan is just a few hundred kilometers away from Taiwan. To top that, it is a US defense ally. Tokyo is bound to get drawn into this war. Which is why pacifist Japan has decided to start spending more on national security. Tokyo plans to increase defense-related spending to 43 trillion yen by 2027. That is about 283 billion US dollars. And guess what? 71% of Japanese are actually in favor of improving the country's military capacity. Then there is also the question of economic security. 90% of Japan's fuel and gas comes in via sea. What happens when the sea lanes are on fire? China has pledged to take Taiwan by diplomacy or by force. China views Taiwan as part of its territory and Chinese leader Xi Jinping wants to achieve what his predecessors have not been able to, which is to bring Taiwan under China's control. It's not just a flare-up in the Taiwan Strait that Japan is concerned about. There are other flashpoints in the waters around Japan. Few hundred kilometers away is the Philippines. Face-off between the Filipino Coast Guard and the Chinese Coast Guard has become the new normal. Chinese boats have been harassing, bullying, water cannoning Filipino Coast Guard and resupply boats. It's all happening near the second Thomas Shoal. This is where the reef is, 200 kilometers from the island of Palawan. China claims the shore and it totally disregards the fact that the reef falls actually within the Filipino EEZ, which is the exclusive economic zone. In fact, it is the threat of China that has driven Japan to work much more closely with the US and the Philippines. The three countries recently held their first joint naval exercise in the South China Sea. All eyes are now on Washington DC. Later this week, Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will be meeting US President Joe Biden and Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. at the White House. No points for guessing. China will be on their mind. Another student from India has been found dead in the United States. Another one. Who was it this time and what really happened and how many such cases have emerged this year itself?
Let's break it all down for you. His name was Muhammad Abdul Arfat. He was all of 25. He hailed from India's Hyderabad. His father, Muhammad Salim, works at construction sites. And just last year, Arfat moved to the U.S. to fulfill his big dreams. He was pursuing a master's degree at Cleveland State University. But about a month ago, something went wrong. Arfat's father last heard from him on the 7th of March, that too only for a few seconds. Arfat told his father that he was missing his uh, family and friends and that he wanted to come home. His father had reassured him that he could come during his vacation and if needed, he would send the airfare as well. But Arfat could not come back home. He never will. After that day, whenever Arfat's father tried to contact his son, the phone was always switched off. His only son had gone missing. Some say he was last seen at a Walmart on the 8th of March. That is according to CCTV footage at the store. Imagine the plight of Arfat's family. Their son had gone missing on foreign soil. They had no means to know exactly what was going on. They could only depend on the authorities and wait to hear something. More than 10 days later, on the 19th of March, the family's worst nightmare came true. Arfat's father received an ominous call from an unknown number. The speaker claimed to be a kidnapper. He said Arfat had been abducted by a drug-selling gang. The caller demanded $1,200, that's close to 1 lakh rupees, to release Arfat. Reports say the kidnapper threatened to sell Arfat's kidney if the family did not pay up. Despite all those threats, he did not explain any payment method. Dejected, Arfat's father turned towards the Indian government. He wrote to the External Affairs Minister, Dr. S. Jan Shankar, seeking his intervention to find his son. On the 21st of March, the Indian consulate in New York said it was in touch with Arfat's family in Telangana and authorities in the U.S., the authorities said they were working with the local law enforcement agencies to find Arfat at the earliest. They did find Arfat, but it was too late. Arfat had died in Cleveland, Ohio. How did that happen? The details are not available. The Indian consulate has said it is anguished to learn of Arfat's death and that it is extending all possible assistance to transport his mortal remains to India. My question here is, why is this happening? What explains this? Is there a pattern here? 11 deaths in little over three months is not a joke. Just last week, another Indian student named Uma Satya Sai Gade was found dead again in Ohio's Cleveland. Abhijit Paruchuru was barely 20. His body was dis discovered in a car deep within a forest in Boston. Last month, Amarnath Ghosh was shot dead in St. Louis, Missouri, he died on the spot. The 34-year-old was a trained classical dancer, a student of Washington University. Before this, 23-year-old Samir Kamath was found dead in a nature reserve in Indiana. He was an Indian-American student at Purdue University. And that same week, Vivek Taneja suffered life-threatening injuries during an assault outside a restaurant in Washington. The 41-year-old was an Indian-origin IT executive. A week before that, Saeed Mazahir Ali, an Indian student, was allegedly attacked by robbers in Chicago. Another 25-year-old Indian student, Vivek Seni, was fatally attacked in Georgia State's Lithonia City by a homeless drug addict. Akul B. Dhavan, an 18-year-old, was found with signs of hypothermia. In January, 19-year-old Shreyas Reddy was found dead. He was a student at the Lindner School of Business in Ohio State. Another Indian student named Neil Acharya at Purdue University, Indiana, was confirmed dead days after going missing. In many cases, the authorities have ruled out foul play, that too, pretty early in the investigation. But the question is, what explains the trend then? 
Also, by the way, the country remains the top choice for Indian students pursuing higher education abroad. According to 2023 data, American colleges enrolled nearly 269,000 students from India. This was the highest figure ever and was second only to China. But will you as a parent be able to sleep soundly at night after sending your kid to America? Think about it.